Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this panel on children's rights and for enforcing uh, digital rights for children in the digital environment. Uh, I'm Denise Amram. I will moderate this uh, uh, panel. And uh, please, if we can start the presentation, I can show you Okay, we have here our speakers, our excellent speakers. I'm very glad uh, that uh, they accept my invitation. So I'm Denis Amram, I'm from uh, Tuscany, uh, from Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, that is uh, a top-ranked university. It is the first in the world um, between the young university. I work at uh, Leader Lab, that is the Laboratorio Interdisciplinare Diritti e Regole. We work on topics on data protection, um, family law, tort law, fundamental rights, uh, IP law, and we are involved in several research projects, uh, H2020 and national projects on these topics, and uh, we are hiring. So feel free to look at our website and uh, um, Please just check if there are any uh, position that you might be interested in. Today we are talking uh, on uh, um, a very uh, current topic uh, with uh, uh, excellent uh, speakers that uh, are lawyers. Uh, we, we are three lawyers and uh, two data scientist uh, engineers in order to uh, deal with uh, um, the risks and opportunities of the IoT environment for vulnerable people and in particular children. Uh, I'm very happy because I attended the um, inspiring uh, panel uh, of yesterday on youths and uh, uh, I, I really appreciated the uh, approach of the colleagues that involved engaged also um, uh, uh, young children so the very uh, uh, interested party data subjects uh, of the topic so I think th this is a very complementary uh, panel and we can enjoy and perhaps have also room of uh, collaboration for further, stu further studies on the topic uh, but let me introduce uh, uh, the speakers of today uh, I have uh, Dr. Katharina Kasling. She is a researcher in law uh, at the University of, uh, of Bonn. Um, then uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Ruggiero Gaetano Penza from University of Turin. He is Associate Professor of Computer Science. Um, then um, I, we have Dr. Juan Martinez uh, Otero. He is here as policymaker in uh, representation of IC Media, but he is a lecturer of administrative law and media uh, at the University of Valencia. And then we have uh, Dr. Uh, Jordi Albo Canal. He is uh, from um, uh, co-founder of Lighthouse Dig and the, in the US, uh, a, and he is also senior research scientist at the Technology for Health and Children's Hospital in Barcelona. So thank you very much for <coughs> being here and. Uh, 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 for uh, your contribution in our panel that is on children's rights, which are the children's rights we are used to refer to the Children's Rights Convention that uh, lists uh, the rights for children related to their education, to their instruction, to their care, uh, to uh, uh, their opportunity to express their opinion, to associate and to uh, and, and the paramount uh, um, criterion to, to be followed in each activity that um, requires uh, and uh, that are addressed to children and involve children is the, be the, the best interest of the child. So this uh, criteria shall be um, adapted to the scenario of the digital environment. And this brings uh, the need to assess new risks. Uh, it, it's a sad news of last week that an Italian 10 years old girl suicide because of an internet challenge. Uh, so this 
did, it didn't happen uh, in the playgrounds uh, uh, a few years ago. Now it could happen and we have to do something in order to prevent it, to avoid it. But we have also to do something in order to uh, promote uh, in the digital environment equality, inclusiveness mm -hmm. and uh, safety. Uh, where not only in... Uh, um, in the daily, in each um, sector of the daily routine. So in at schools, we will see some projects related to how to engage schools, how to engage institutions, how to um, exercise the responsibilities at home by playing with 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 the toys, friends, the role of uh, companion robots, also in the health care when when children uh, need special care, and this is particularly true. Uh, not only in the physiology um, development of, of the of the um, children's life uh, that have access on internet and have access uh, to this new revolution, to the technology revolution, but th this should be uh, promoted and enhanced also all around the world. We have to consider that three up out to five children uh, in Africa do not internet access. So we have also to work on safety and security and preserving good data protection and to enhancing all the other fundamental rights of children in the digital environment as a new scenario and new environment while the child has to grow up. But we have also to avoid that the digital environment could be uh, a barrier, a, a, a further barrier to economical, social, societal and social uh, development. So um, these are the two main um, lines that we would like to address in this panel. And I'm very glad to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Katharina Kaslin from the University of Bonn, uh, asking her to give us um, a legal framework of we are, what we are talking about in order to frame from a legal viewpoint our panel. Thank you very much, Katharina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Denise. I am pleased to be able to present some aspects today regarding the legal framework of children's rights and the digital environment. Children's rights as such have a number of sources on various levels, as we have already heard. In addition to the rights enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and all the various national constitutions, specific rights of children can be found. In Germany, for example, the governing parties plan to include specific rights in the basic law, our constitution, in 2021. These discussions are primarily due to the principles set out in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Nearly globally ratified with the infamous example of the US, the UNCRC holds considerable potential for dealing with children's participation and protection in digitalized contexts. Children, of course, enjoy all being human themselves freedom of expression, freedom of information, and many more. Privacy of children, however, only became a priority for children in the 21st century. Children's rights to privacy today, specifically addressed in instruments such as the GDPR in the European Union, has already been guaranteed by Article 16 of the UNCRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, since 1989. The protection of these children's rights is integrated into a rather complicated national system of parental rights and duties and state oversight. For example, drawing from German law, under our constitution, the basic law, the care and education of children is the natural right of parents and their primary duty. The state community shall, however, supervise the parental activities. This triangular relationship between children, parents and the state has been altered by the appearance of additional powerful players, 
such as globally operating social media platforms and provider toys and smart home systems. On the digital playground, children encounter diverse risks, many of which are covert and hard to assess for both adults and children. This has led to a risk-based narrative of children's participation online, against which children's rights have been emphasized from a social psychology point of view first. We might all know the works of Sonia Livingston. Beyond that, children's best interests are paramount, notwithstanding the area of law they are affected by. An analysis of their realization therefore presupposes a comprehensive view of different areas of law, including contract law, family law, IP law, intellectual property law, data protection law, and of course, platform regulation. Consumption and creation of user-generated content touches all dimensions of children's rights. They are often framed as provision, protection, and participation in the context of the UNCRC. Joining a social media platform, for example, such as Facebook or TikTok, requires a contractual agreement for which the applicable national contract law generally limits the capacity of children and requires parental consent. In addition, consent has to be given or authorized by the holder of parental responsibility under Article 8 GDPR regarding the processing of the child's data. The GDPR thus limits the children's autonomy on the basis of an abstract estimation of the children's ability, ranging from 13 years to 16 years under the member state's discretions. As part of the digital parental responsibility, parents can be obliged to prevent violations of rights by their children. Under German law, they are required to prevent with appropriate measures, personality or IP rights infringements online. Also, the exercise of parental rights may be restricted with a view to their children's rights. For example, in the context of sharenting, where parents over share family pictures or pictures of the children without their consent, which again begs the question, how children's rights are protected or if, after all, their right to privacy is purely dependent on the respective family dynamics without an effective protection of children's rights as such. Instruments of platform regulation can safeguard children's rights in some important aspects. Children are content creators as well as consumers. Their choices are influenced by recommender systems and they are targeted by personalized advertising as we all are. While safeguards by design are incredibly important, all restrictions must be justified with regard to children's rights as well. For example, Article 28B of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive foresees protective filtering. The Digital Services Act, as proposed by the Commission, also mentions children's rights, specifically with respect to systemic dangers, systemic risks, which are to be evaluated by a very large platform under that proposal. However, children's rights are generally a second thought in these contexts. Even more so, children's participatory rights do not play a considerable role or any role that would mirror their importance with a view to the everyday sociality online and online youth cultures, whose importance, as we all know, has only risen during the pandemic. Known data breaches have affected children at the youngest ages, even in the context of educational platforms. Also, toy makers are recording more and more data. Consequently, a toy is no longer something that is solely for a child to play with. The current legal approach for managing children's use of these type of digital products is parental consent. 
The introduction of software and data collection has created a complexity in the relationship between child and toy. Manufacturers of such toys provide their own privacy policies specific to their products. High profile cases of such toys spying on children were the Hello Barbie, which was famously hacked in 2015, and My Friend Kayla, which was a line of dolls using speech recognition technology in conjunction with a mobile app to recognize the child's speech and have a conversation. This doll allowed the use of the collected data from the child's speech for targeted advertisements and other commercial purposes. Though the doll's positive statements about certain products and services, it offered hidden advertisements. Now, children are less likely than a parent or other carer to understand all implications of bringing a connected device into the home. But reliance on parental protection alone cannot effectively protect children, as security is only as strong as humans, who act, a lot of the times, out of convenience. Especially with regard to toys and smart applications in family homes, a stronger regulation targeting the design and production stage is needed. And we will learn more about those from my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katharina, for this um, complete framework, a legal framework of what our engineers and data scientists are going to tell us about the applications and the involvement of children's rights and the risks and the opportunities of, of the uh, technology innovation for the future. We have to remind that the children of today are the first generation that do not not remember a time without smartphones and this is uh, um, I'm quoting uh, uh, UNICEF uh, it, it's not uh, it, it's it, it, it's true uh, and so we, now um, we we have to risks and opportunities are what are um, uh, are essential to grow up the future society so um, I would like to ask to Professor uh, Ruggiero Gaetano Pensa, um, which are the main uh, privacy preserving techniques from a computer science, um, computer science uh, point of view, and which are the projects that can uh, involve also institutions, schools, um, parents, in order to share awareness about the risks, the privacy risks for children and and the role of uh, the social media and social networks in the daily routine from a data scientist viewpoint. Thank you, Professor. The floor is yours. Thank you, Denise. So if I can uh, see my slides, thank you. So um, thank you for the question, because actually it's uh, really uh, what I'm working on since uh, uh, quite a long time now, uh, I started working on artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. And then I soon uh, uh, recognized the need for some privacy preservation in these techniques because uh, for uh, human dignity was at risk. And in particular, uh, children dignity was at, also at risk. So I will start with, um, uh, by introducing two points which are very important when we talk about privacy in the digital world. And they are uh, two uh, phenomena that are being have been observed and, uh, and that concern the way users uh, look at privacy <laughs> when they interact with uh, machines in general, but uh, digital environments in particular. So they are the well-known para privacy paradox and privacy fatigues. Basically, uh, users and, and also children know uh, exactly what privacy means, okay? The problem is that uh, even though they are concerned about privacy, uh, basically they uh, undertake very little um, activities to protect their personal data. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they know how to, uh, to undertake these activities, how to, uh, to, to protect their privacy, for instance, in uh, the social media platforms and so on, but they do nothing for 
uh, actually protecting their privacy. Uh, this is also due to another phenomenon that is called privacy fatigue. So the privacy fatigue is basically a kind of feeling of loss of control, uh, which is also due to uh, increasing difficult difficulties in uh, managing uh, online privacy. Because of course, uh, since there are many ways to protect privacy, also user sometimes are very difficult to use for uh, uh, all people and in particular for children in some cases and uh, basically even though uh, most social media offer some kind of uh, um, control over privacy uh, basically they are not used um, another uh, another reason for this privacy fatigue is that basically all the uh, um, data breaches that we know and that they uh, that happen uh, that, that that happened also in the, the last year um, introduce an, a sense of utility in uh, all that uh, can be undertaken in order to protect privacy. So these are two well-studied phenomena in uh, computer behavior and also in computer science. And um, I think that uh, uh, we try to address this, these problems uh, in uh, two different ways. Uh, so in my research groups, we are working on both uh, sides of the problem. So the computational one and the educational one. Uh, I started working with the computational one, okay? But uh, um, for many reasons, uh, I also uh, was involved in the uh, educational point of view of uh, um, how to enhance uh, privacy awareness uh, in uh, children in particular. So from the computational point of view, there are many technological, uh, technological, um, uh, technological way to address this problem. There are many privacy preserving techniques. So for instance, uh, you probably all know differential privacy, uh, secure multi-party computation, uh, federated learning, and in particular, um, secure federated learning. So all these approaches that I am also studying with my research group are important to protect data from the server side, okay? But of course, uh, people interact with some kind of user interfaces and you also need to enhance these user interfaces by make people aware about their privacy risk during their um, cyber social activities. So for instance, by computing some kind of uh, uh, context aware privacy budget that can uh, be um, notified to the users or to measure the risk of each cyber social action. And we are also uh, doing research in this direction. Uh, from the educational point of view, uh, my uh, opinion and the opinion of my research group is also that uh, we should let children play with the social media. And the reason is simple because uh, even though smartphones were not there when I was a child, uh, I must say that. Uh, my parents uh, um, forbid me to uh, use uh, uh, video games. They didn't want to, uh, to buy uh, a console, okay? But I actually used the consoles of my friends in their homes. So basically, technology is here, okay? You cannot ignore the technology. Uh, even though the pa parents don't uh, let um, children play with social media, they probably will play in other environments like school, uh, friends, uh, houses, and so on. Um, the problem is that uh, we should let children understand the uh, social dynamics, how social dynamics work, for instance. And uh, one of the important, most important social dynamic uh, phenomenon is the information diffusion, which is really uh, uh, ignored in some cases uh, by children. And this is uh, uh, something that I actually experienced directly uh, during my activities. And, uh, and also, of course, we should let children understand the possible consequences of their cyber social actions, okay, which is important too. And uh, so in, um, concerning the first part, uh, so the, te te the technological parts and the uh, scientific part, uh, with my research group, we also uh, we, 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 uh, contributed uh, to the uh, development of uh, um, the technology for privacy preserving tech the, the, the privacy presented te technologies in social media in particular by uh, presenting some kind of uh, uh, measure uh, for privacy uh, that can be used to, for instance, provide users with some kind of uh, privacy budget they, uh, that they should try not to consume. Uh, and uh, every time that you 
under, that you undertake some kind of social action, uh, you will consume this kind of privacy budget, and then you will end up with no privacy at all. But we also measure some kind of uh, privacy in the context of networks, because not all networks are the same, and in the network, not all uh, the uh, mm, the different parts of the network are uh, are uh, similarly uh, vulnerable. And um, and um, in the last uh, period, we are also uh, testing some kind of uh, uh, automatic uh, um, tools to uh, detect the content sensitivity of some of text, for instance, in order to uh, predict it, the sensitivity towards privacy of uh, something that is written by the users. Uh, but I, I would like to, um, okay, the, the, the final goal uh, is uh, basically when you want to post something on, uh, for instance, on Facebook, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, there is there should be something that uh, uh, warn you about uh, the uh, possible risk of posting uh, this, the, that particular item on Facebook. For instance, uh, according, if you look at this uh, simple uh, post here, uh, the idea is that uh, should I post it or not? What are the consequences of posting this, uh, uh, this text on uh, Facebook? So this is the direction where we are trying to uh, go. But I would like to spend some time in, uh, uh, also in uh, introducing um, my activities and the, my research group's activities uh, in schools uh, playing with social media and privacy. And the motivation of these, um, of these activities, of these uh, research and educational activities uh, are both personal and less personal. Let's say that in the first picture, uh, in the left side of the slide, you see uh, basically a picture of me with my wife having a walk in some uh, some uh, city. Okay, uh, the, the the fact is that uh, uh, this picture, I I have no idea that there were some people taking this picture actually, and uh, we get this picture uh, on uh, WhatsApp by the sister of my wife. Okay, who uh, found it in a Snapchat group, okay? Including all uh, children, all uh, uh, living in the, that city. And uh, when I get this picture, I realized that when we were uh, having this walk, there were two, two girls uh, sitting on a bank that were actually playing with a smartphone. But we didn't have any idea that they were going to take a picture uh, of us, okay? and. Uh, this also is a, a quite good demonstration of how um, information diffusion is uh, uh, can be uh, really uh, neglected in some kind in some uh, situation, and this was really uh, my uh, personal motivating uh, situation. But uh, soon after this uh, event, I realized that uh, basically uh, children used smartphone. The problem is that they use smartphone in uh, uh, not in the right way. Sometimes alone, in particular, young children use the smartphone uh, without the supervision of uh, parents. Uh, and in, uh, sometimes I also realized that they were, um, for instance, putting some kind of uh, the hearts on uh, uh, Instagram by double tapping the photos without waiting for these photos to actually uh, appear on the screen. Okay, so. Uh, because of this uh, really basic uh, motivation, I start uh, I start working with this platform, and I uh, created this platform together with my students and my research group. Uh, and this is a, a social simulation game. Uh, it is called Social for School because in, Ita in Italy, social uh, stands for social media. Okay, is a, a, a way to call social media, and. Uh, uh, it is a platform which is intended for uh, schools. Uh, we, uh, a teacher who uh, guide the activity and children that connect together, okay, in a, a social network, including them, but where social links are created uh, at random by the system. And uh, children can interact using uh, um, an interface which is very similar to uh, popular. Uh, social media interfaces. They can choose uh, uh, posts, okay, that are have already been uh, written by us, of course, uh, with different kind of uh, privacy and so on. I'm, I'm sorry, the interface is in Italian because we work with Italian schools, so we have to 
facing Italian, but you can imagine uh, yeah. these, uh, what is uh, in, uh, what appear in this interface. So they can interact with each other, putting some likes, uh, sharing uh, the posts of, of other friends and so on. And the teachers also have an interface uh, which uh, let them uh, guide the activity, control whether everything is going uh, okay. Um, they also have some time, something that help them uh, conduct um, an educational activity following the um, the computer activity okay and uh, uh, in using this interface uh, we uh, we discovered that children uh, soon understand uh, were able to understand uh, the dynamics of social media because privacy was not in question at the, because children know the concept of privacy uh, they associated it with the concept of secret sometimes but in general they can they can know uh, what we what privacy mean the problem is that they usually uh, don't understand uh, completely the dynamics of social media so the it was also interesting to validate this uh, platform and we did it in uh, several schools uh, with um, uh, nearly uh, 500 students 500 uh, um, students aged from uh, uh, nine to 11 years. And uh, um, the results of this activity, which were also published, uh, showed that actually our uh, method, our, uh, our platform, together with the, the uh, intervention of the teachers, is uh, very uh, effective. Um, we, of course, try to, um, uh, I'm, I, we are also trying to uh, expand this interface uh, by also uh, including other problems like fake, new, uh, fake news detection and uh, cyber uh, bullying, uh, cyber bullying uh, also pre uh, prevention and so on. But anyway, uh, to conclude my uh, intervention here, um, I would, I would uh, like to introduce two different perspectives. One is the, uh, from the industrial point of view, and the other one is from the societal point of view. So from the industrial point of view, I think that it is very important to raise privacy by design principles in the design of every technology, and in particular for technology that are um, explicitly designed for uh, children. Uh, this is very important, even though uh, sometimes it's very difficult. And it is also very important to make users aware about the risk of disclosing their personal information, not only when, when, they, uh, um, when they join some kind of platform uh, by giving their consent on the use of data, but during all the activities uh, performed on these platforms, in particular social media platforms, but not only social media platforms. Uh, it is important to use state-of-the-art uh, data protection techniques, but it is important to use them in the correct way, because if we use differential privacy with uh, a high privacy budget, we are not protecting privacy at all, okay? And um, I think that to, uh, to, to finally arrive to a sustainable uh, technology, we have to take into account the privacy of users, okay? And this is a, a very important point. Uh, um, from uh, that inspired my research too. From the societal point of view, uh, I think that besides educating children, we, I think that we should educate parents and teachers first. Um, because uh, I, 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 when, I, when I conducted my activities in the schools, uh, something that uh, I was told was that uh, parents need also this kind of education. And uh, that's why sometimes we conduct these activities with children and parents together. Uh, I think that we should also educate politicians because the, sometimes they, um, they talk about technology without uh, knowing uh, exactly the dynamics and the, uh, social te and the, te the te te technological details of uh, uh, the, these technologies and how uh, they work. Uh, the multidisciplinary approach is important, and this panel is a, is a, a perfect demonstration of this. And uh, I also think that technology cannot be ignored. I also I already expressed it this point uh, when I introduced my talk. Uh, we cannot um, prevent, I think, children uh, uh, of using uh, technology because technology is here. Parents have a smartphone. Okay, uh, their friends have a smartphone. 
uh, teachers a smartphone. So uh, the world uh, where children uh, live is uh, uh, basically full of technology. Uh, I also think that uh, uh, age gates won't work. This is also something that has been uh, proposed in Italy uh, following the recent uh, uh, news uh, that uh, Denise also introduced. Uh, I think that these age gates won't work because there are very many ways to bypass them. And this is, is this not the correct way to, uh, I, in my opinion, to address this, this, uh, this problem. And in general, I think that we should spread the culture of protecting data privacy in all uh, the aspects of society, including uh, our work, uh, in particular when we work in, in uh, the, the, pro the, the production of uh, systems and software, but in general in uh, our everyday life. And uh, uh, before uh, uh, I also invite you to, uh, to, to, to have a look to this uh, uh, famous uh, manifesto on digital humanism, uh, which also includes some of the points that I also uh, I have introduced in this talk. Um, but I really uh, um, invite you to read it and to uh, also to sign it if you think that is it is a uh, uh, worth thing signing it. And finally, uh, let me uh, thank uh, all the people that helped me uh, doing my research, in particular uh, uh, Sara Kapecki, who is an, now in charge of uh, conducting the activities of Social for School in schools and in other associations. And you also see here in uh, grey uh, all the people that actually de developed uh, the, the platform. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, collaboration with uh, psychologists and other um, other staff from the University of Turin, uh, which had very different, uh, with very different uh, um, backgrounds, and uh, we also had uh, a, a very tight collaboration with uh, teachers. Uh, without them, without these teachers, basically uh, this platform would uh, never have existed. So thank you, and uh, if you have any question. I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ruggiero. Thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. You touched many uh, topics uh, considering uh, the area of platforms. So you uh, touched the topics related to uh, the children's parents relationship. You touched the the the, um, con the, the content uh, uh, reference uh, and how to produce uh, new knowledge in uh, in the social uh, networks and and how to make children aware of the consequence of the, what they are going to write, to, to listen to, to, to share. And you touch the uh, topic related to images. Uh, now, uh, so, so thank you ver very much and give, of course, uh, privacy preserving suggestions and uh, methodological ones. And you uh, launch the, um, uh, the ball to uh, the indus industrial uh, environment. So uh, it's the, um, the turn of um, uh, Jordi Albo Canals, uh, who uh, is co-founder of uh, Lighthouse uh, DAG in the US. He produces uh, uh, companion robots and uh, perhaps uh, he is going to tell us something about other kind of data that are processed by artificial intelligence based um, applications and uh, uh, and robots. Uh, for example, the uh, they, they are able to interact when they are able to interact with the children and uh, keep their emotions perceptions and the consequence that we have to look at considering our different roles as parents as academics as policy makers as developers as data protection officer of uh, this kind of companies that develops these uh, uh, robots uh, so please uh, Horty, the floor is yours Okay, uh, so thank you very much and uh, I, I highly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, I, uh, I need to know not to be like in, uh, around all these uh, amazing uh, panelists because it's like they approach a lot of the things that are behind uh, the work that I want to show. So uh, the idea is to expose that uh, 
um, uh, the, the, the work that I have been doing uh, with uh, several images uh, that uh, showcase the projects that are related to all these topics. Uh, I titled uh, my uh, short talk about, uh, with the same title that one of the papers that um, uh, I, I did together with uh, Edward Fosk, that it's uh, I'll care of you, said the robot. So um, let's go to the same slide. Uh, uh, the, the idea, it's like we are living in a blended reality between humans and technology. So uh, we want to protect privacy and data, uh, we need to be careful about if even the way that we are taking care of the technology, the human being, it's going to create a harm, uh, maybe driven by the technology or maybe dri uh, driven by other humans that are using that technology. This harm, we, we used to think that this harm, it's uh, like a physical harm, uh, um, but sometimes it's also kind of psychological or emotional harm. And, and finally, uh, because my background is also in uh, social technology, effective computing or social robotics, uh, we play a lot with the deception in some cases, because sometimes the technology is not ready yet, in, especially related to AI. And then it's like, uh, we, we pretend that the robot is doing some things and we play with the deception. So if, if we look to, to this slide, that is one of the projects, this is a cooperative uh, framework between uh, caregivers and uh, students that they are learning to build robots, but the robot itself, there's a social robot that it's assisting in a cooperative task, helping the teacher. These robots are not full autonomous, they are hybrid. They are like marionettes, like puppets. They are teleoperated by artificial agents and at the same time, they are, uh, uh, teleoperated by humans that are driving the robots. So everything is connected through the cloud. We really need to ensure that this cloud is protected. So um, if we go to the next, like we will see that uh, it's like every single robot, it's an interface between the digital world and the human. It's like a child assistant agent and it's collecting the information and it's protecting this information locally. And then this information that it's already processed and it's like unidentify it and the thing that we want to, to do, it's sending to a like shared space where like other experts can have access to that and supervise that learning process of the system that it's providing the right response of the robot. However, we need to take into account that we cannot skip the fact that there are humans interacting with technology and they always find a way, and that it was uh, some projects showed to us, uh, uh, to bypass all these layers of protections in the terms of using. So we need to be aware about that and manage that liability. I want to show also one of the projects that has been being applied and developed at Tufts University recently and applied because of the COVID-19 that it's like multiple kids, they can interact uh, and learn uh, with different types of robots using Google Slides. So we, at Tufts University, we create like a, like a Google Slide uh, button. So you share the slide and you have a sidebar with the image of the robot, maybe the images of other kids, even when you can see in the image that the kids are like protected. Uh, they can share things, they can talk, they can explain, they can write on the slides, they can share even the code. And this is a kind of ex exposure what, what they are doing. Um, uh, at the end, it's like we have a facilitator that is remote, but because also this facilitator is remote, this digital environment, it, it's avoiding to have full control about what is happening. Uh, on the kids' sites. And, and when we run the different workshops, even when we have an IRB and we have all the kind of like boundaries to try to protect what was happening, there are things that are unexpected. And then it's like sometimes one kid was showing like one of the pets, some others was like walking around with the computer. And uh, and yeah, and as Rogero said, it's like you really need to educate carefully about what it has to be done or not because it's like uh, there's a trade-off between the level of data protection and uh, the, the, uh, and how free you are to use that technology in an efficient way. Um, this is more examples about how the platform work and you can see like in different slides, the pictures that you can see here, it's my daughter. So it's like uh, easy to share. And, and then you can see the different parts of the platform and how this platform is built. And as I said, it's, it's on Google Cloud. Uh, one of the last projects that, that has been recent public, uh, it's, a com uh, it's, a, it's a joint force between the Barcelona Children's Hospital 
Hyundai Motor and, uh, and MIT, where we design a robotic car that is uh, understanding the level of stress of the kids before surgery and taking care of them. So this is like a car that is connected to the cloud. It's connecting all the information uh, from different signals of the body. This information is processed locally. And then we have like even physical ways to send all the information to the research team that is between Europe and the US. Um, and when we are designing all these platforms, what we are doing, and that it's a work that it was developed by Edward Fosk. It's like we have like a, an assessment tool that is trying to preserve the human rights of the technology. So being sure that it's like we are not uh, breaking, uh, creating harm. We are respecting authority. We, the, the system is loyal to the user and the supervisor. It's fair for everyone and it respects the purity, so not revealing things that it shouldn't be revealed. So this is like an assessment. You follow the assessment before designing the platform. And this is a robot that was helping kids in Barcelona to learn about math. Uh, and it was also developed at Tufts University. I, I would like to go, uh, if we can go two slides before that one, please. Uh, yeah, that one. So if you see this, this image, you can see like a kid interacting with a robot in a learning environment. but. What is behind this sense in some cases is that the robot is not full autonomous. So, you know, you have like one guy that is remote controlling the robot and even sending text to the kids. This is creating deception. Deception, it helps you to create a better immersion and a better engagement and an emotional bonding between a technology that looks very human and a kid. It has a lot of benefits, but it needs to be regulated. Uh, been using that uh, with kids with traumatic brain injury to have like a more intense uh, cognitive recovery process. We have been using that with kids with uh, chemotherapy to try to be distracted and forget that they are at the hospital. And um, it, it's uh, it's interesting to, to play with this powerful, uh, powerful tool of deception. But what is happening? So you, you, you can regulate it from a normative perspective in a book and a work lead by Cesar Hidalgo, uh, now at, in Toulouse, but before that at MIT at Collective Learning, we create uh, and we publish a, a book about how humans judge machines. So we invented 80 scenarios and then we, we run mechanical tour to see how people were perceiving the results of the different actions when things were going well, when things were going wrong, where things were driven by a machine and where things were driven by, uh, by a human. And, and the way that it's judged is different. So when we regulate all these boundaries in terms of what is happening, what we can do, privacy, etc., we need to take into account that people are not judging machines, are they are judging humans. And at the end, we want to design technology that it serves the society. So we need to be sure that we are serving the society uh, in, the, in the way that they want to be served. Um, so just to finish my talk, uh, I agree with uh, the rest of the speakers and the panelists that uh, the power of perception is very good to educate the kids. So this is an example of the Barcelona Science Museum when we were teaching kids about what, how we code emotions into a robot and what does it mean, how the robot reacts. It was a workshop for kids from six years uh, and above and uh, to, to understand how the robots work. And um, and I want just to finish my uh, my uh, my presentation with the last slide. That is the next project. It's a European grant that was just awarded at the hospital, and we want to design uh, a, a, social, a social robot interface in uh, pediatric palliative care. That it's helping the quality of life of the family members of uh, children that uh, most of them, unfortunately, they they are going to to pass away. So we want to have a compassionate AI system that is taking care of uh, all, all the family and being full connected to the medical staff, augmented the workforce of the, the medical doctors. And with this, I finish my presentation. I will be super open to questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much because we had in this way a real picture of how many opportunities this kind of application may have in the life of a child from schools, from museums, or from toys, uh, from, from uh, um, hospitals and uh, how to manage also their health data, their perceptions, they to, to take care of them in all their kind of vulnerabilities. 
but also the, the, the need to uh, pay attention to uh, how they re receive this kind of, of, of interactions and they can elaborate in, in their growing up. So our children are all users are, and the users are also consumers of, of these kinds of applications. So from a policy making perspective and uh, uh, I would like to to ask to um, Juan um, what are his suggestions in, in this um, in, in how to empower uh, children uh, um, as vulnerable person but attentive aware consumers and end users of these new technologies and uh, and uh, and the, the, this new uh, application that are part of their daily life. Thank you, Juan. Please, yours. Okay, thank you, Denise, for all your work preparing all the, uh, this panel. And also, I would like to thank the technical staff for making it possible. Yeah, I would like to divide my presentation in three slides. I will talk about for me what are the most pregnant issues that public policies uh, need to address. Secondly, I would, I would like to present some obstacles that public powers have when they are trying to tackle these challenges or these problems. And finally, I would like to present the priorities that, from my point of view, uh, public powers need to, need to address, okay? So, um, well, the interest and rights at stake, Catalina has presented them quite well. For me, the most important of them are the, the following. Uh, first of all, public powers have to protect physical and safety children. And that has to do with problems linked with addiction to screens, with health and nutrition, with socialization, how children are establishing relationships with their peers, and finally, with their ability to pay attention and to focus in what they are doing. Well, alongside with that, there are also a vast number of problems linked with data protection. Uh, we have to protect data protection rights of children against the interest of companies that sometimes they try to foster consumerism attitudes in children. Secondly, I think it's interesting to pay attention to the some risks come from the state um, that can try to influence ideologically the children. I mean, this has been done with adults. We have seen that in 2016 in Brexit or in Trump's election. So that can be done with children as well. So we have to be careful about that. And finally, uh, parents. I mean, we assume that parents take care of their kids, but sometimes parents try to overprotect the children and maybe they will have some interest in uh, get all the information from their kids or their children. And also this, like parenthood as well, no? this uh, sharing information of their children in social networks that maybe are damaging for children. So for me, these are the main lines that uh, public policies uh, need to address. Well, secondly, I would like to just present some obstacles uh, to these public policies that we have to bear in mind to understand why sometimes it's so difficult to uh, regulate um, internet, digital tools, and internet of things. Well, first of all, there is the speed of technological advance that make it, very, make it very difficult for regulators to understand what's going on and to approve or pass on regulations. This has to do as well the second obstacle which is the one of the complexity. I mean, to provide a good answer to something, you need to know what. And sometimes it's very difficult to, to learn or to know what's going on on the internet, all these algorithmical advances. And so I think that many people and many politicians are a little bit disoriented, as Ruggiero said before, and when it reaches the time of offering a, a solution. Well, a third obstacle is globalization. We are facing global problems and most of the times we are using just national solutions. So for states, sometimes it's discouraging to, to realize how very little efficiency the regulations are going to, to be. Well, 
there is this huge power of the market and the challenge mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes, I mean, the states feel like powerless against all this power and uh, judges, legislators, and so on, they feel like there is nothing that they can do. So that's another obstacle. Uh, in the fifth, uh, the next one is the optimistic bias. I would like to uh, develop this idea a little bit. I think we are fascinated about technology. We tend to see only the good effects of that. And we are becoming a little bit blind to the problems that and have. Um, well, this over-optimistic approach sometimes makes it difficult for politicians to address these issues in an effective way, you know, because we only want to look at the bright side of development. I think that with kids uh, and with children, this is very, very common. I mean, we tend to, every now and then, we say, wow, things may be, um, we have to change this, we have to change that, but we tend to look at the bright side and sometimes we tend to forget um, these negative effects. Um, well, the sixth, I have talked about that a little bit, so I'm the seventh one, the seventh one, which is the scarce resources. It's evident that Internet of Things and digital tools are very efficient. But the point is that sometimes to educate children, efficiency is not the best token. Um, Human rights sometimes are at odds with efficiency. And we are creating a digital world that works very well, it's very efficient, but sometimes can ignore the best interest of children. Just one example, these wonderful robots that Jordi is developing, they are the most efficient way of taking care of a children, of, of a child. But the point is, do we think that that efficient answer is the best one? Maybe in some hospital with many children, many children there, you need these robots, but sometimes it human attention. So we have we need to find a balance between efficiency, which is important, but also respect to human dignity and the children's interest. So I think that these seven obstacles uh, make it very difficult for public powers to draw or to establish public policies. Well. Talking now about this, uh, the third part of my intervention, um, which would be for me the most important lines for public policies to develop. Well, first of all, we can talk about regulation. And here I just want to present two ideas that I think that can be developed. The first one is a simplification of the regulation. I don't know what's the, the take of Ruggiero and Jordi on this issue, but for me, I'm a lawyer, I've been studying regulations for many years and I still find them confusing. I mean, Catalina did a wonderful job doing a resume on an outline of the regulation, but regulation tend to be very, very long and very, very complex. So I think that policymakers should try to simplify and maybe pass on regulations that are based on just principles and leave more room to judges and to national authorities to interpret and to develop these principles, because if not, we are creating uh, such a huge regulation and so that, I mean, so complex that it's very difficult to, to know what to do. Well, secondly, I think that another thing that can be done is to regulate the access to pornography. I mean, pornography is the elephant in the room. 70% of teenagers in Spain are accessing to pornography regularly as uh, Save the Children has said recently in a recent report, uh, most of is violent, uh, doesn't respect the quality, is discriminatory to, to women. So I think that one line or to protect children online would be to regulate this. I think that in Italy, France, in the United Kingdom, they are discussing some way of uh, guaranteeing uh, that people who access to this content are adults. Well, that's one line, the line of regulation. Hand in hand with that, I mean, it's useless to have a regulation if you are not applying it. I think that the directives of the European Union and the regulation on data protection is not bad, but the point is that national authorities, sometimes they lack the human power and the financial resources to put that regulations into effect. So I think that one of the priorities of public policy should be to focus the resources on how to make that regulations that are fair, and I think are protected enough, and 
are re respected by huge companies, okay? Well, and finally, and this is the last point that I think that is the most important, last but not least, is the promotion. How public powers and national authorities need to work hand in hand with um, stakeholders uh, and with the industry, first of all, to foster or support self-regulation, to guarantee that the companies are establishing some codes and guidance to protect children online. Secondly, to fund research. I think this is very interesting. I mean, we need to know and we need to learn which are the effects of technology in children, the good ones and the bad ones. And once we have this um, amount of evidence, of scientific evidence, multidisciplinary evidence, uh, we can develop uh, public policies. But I feel that nowadays we don't have that scientific grounds to make decisions about regulation in this issue. So it would be very interesting to fund research. Uh, foster awareness and promote, I mean, uh, te teachers, professors, parents, children, uh, teach them which are the risks and which are the side effects of using technology that much. Of course, which are the opportunities as well. I mean, but uh, to promote this awareness and make people and make parents demand on companies protection to children. That would be very interesting. And finally, to invest money in alternative for time. I think it's very sad that sometimes kids, uh, they don't have alternatives to uh, their free time. And uh, the only alternative is to spend time in the screens. So if public powers develop money, invest money in gardens, parks, sports, that would be, um, that can balance the amount of time they spend in front of the screens. And I think that that would uh, help a lot uh, all this harmonic development. Well, that's just that was just some lines of the, uh, I think, the, the main things that can be done from a, a public policy point of view. Thank you for your attention. And I'm open to, to engage in a debate that probably would be very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I thank you for your uh, closing remarks on policy making. Uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, with your, your view. Um, I would like just to add that uh, considering uh, uh, if we extract some principles from your uh, talk, say that we need more transparency. Uh, we need an accountable approach towards new technologies for all stakeholders, from parents that uh, have and caregivers to the uh, AI developers and IoT platforms maintainers, and also politicians, uh, lawmakers, and uh, and and scholars. So this is uh, uh, we may say that we can represent these categories in this dialogue that we established in this panel. So I, I, I'm very very proud of it and satisfied. Thank you so much for your uh, your talks and, and and your contribution to this. And I I hope this is the one of the first uh, opportunities to work together, but to do something uh, of really impactful on the topic because we we, we really um, we are really all involved for different uh, from different perspective on on this mission on this cultural change. Um, we received a lot of uh, co uh, congratulations for uh, the panel. I'm very happy. And we have a couple of questions. The first one is related to the Vienna Manifesto, if uh, Ruggiero can give some more information. And another one is the concept of vulnerable subject, that is the... Um, a uh, topic where uh, the, the, the Gian Claudio Malgeri is uh, an expert. So, what we mean for vulnerable sub children as vulnerable subject subjects, or um, in our perspectives, uh, in our different uh, uh, views. So, please, I don't know. Perhaps Ruggiero may start with uh, the uh, some clarification on the Vienna Manifesto, and then yeah. gives uh, his. Uh, uh, opinion on uh, vulnerabilities from a computer science point, or point yeah. of view for children. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple of minutes each because we have just 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. 
Yeah, basically, the, this uh, manifesto has been signed, uh, it's been promoted in uh, 2019. And basically, the idea is that uh, the promoter of this Vienna manifesto argue for some, uh, for a digital humanism that analyzes and influences the complex interplay of technology and humankind. And uh, also for a better society and life, uh, which fully respect universal human rights. And uh, to achieve this goal, there are several principles. I will mention a couple of them. First of all, the, the fact that digital technologies should be designed to promote democracy and inclusion. And, uh, and also that the privacy and freedom of speech are essential values for democracy and should be at the center of the activities. But in particular, I embrace the last one or the last of these principles, which is that the education on computer science and informatics and uh, its societal impact must start as early as possible. So this is in particular the point that um, I want to stress uh, and that uh, educating people on basic computer comp principles and artificial intelligence principle is very important nowadays and this manifesto uh, uh, try to uh, try to uh, put together all the aspects that uh, should also be included in a uh, future society um, it also it is also been signed by some companies and also by some institution like uh, informatics europe and other uh, um, computer science institution, a very important computer science institution. So I, I invite you to have a, a, a more uh, in-depth look to this, uh, uh, to this manifesto. Thank you. And what about the idea of vulnerable uh, subjects? Well, children are vulnerable per se, and then they may have uh, other vulnerabilities that may um, make them more vulnerable than other children. Or sometimes we have mature children that uh, can be more um, aware of adults, for example. Uh, so how we can uh, create a multi-level um, system of vulnerabilities for children from my perspective is uh, an impact assessment viewpoint so with, with the risk assessment approach uh, we can try to uh, create categories but what what is your opinion on, on this perhaps katharina would you like to to say something from a legal perspective or juan or jordi as a developer after thank you well thank you I think um, right now is one that works very much with abstract assessments, as I said, meaning that the individual capabilities of the children are not reflected in the approaches, especially in the GDPR. And as such, will translate to other areas of the law in national law, possibly. Because member states have the opportunity, for example, with regard to data protection, to set the autonomy age lower than 16 down to 13 in part also because this might be their legal capacity so the, the this might be the age for the legal capacity in the national state and this overall makes for a concept where we only have strict systems of age so it's a coherent system on the other hand we used to at least with regard to contract law and also with regard to the parent-child relationship, take account of the individual person, the individual child at stake. This means that there, one would have a sort of abstract age, but there is more leeway to go in one or the other direction. And these elements can only be reintroduced if children can fight for themselves and make their rights heard and their opinion heard, even in the face of the parents, which in the end have to translate them to the outside world, would be my very concise answer. Thank you. Uh, Juan or Jordi? Can I add just something very, very yep. fast? I think that it would be interesting to just not to think in children as vulnerable groups, but to thinking human beings as vulnerable group in front of technology. Democracy is a vulnerable reality in front of technology. I think that we have to become more aware of how this 
amazing job engineers do. It's so amazing that to resist and to find our way. So I don't know how, but I think that public policies um, should find a way to explain things to people. I think that recently the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, has been a wonderful way of making people aware of what can be happening here. And I don't know how working together, engineers, lawyers, psychologists, sociologists, I think we have to be able to present to society all these wonderful risks that come with all these wonderful challenges and opportunities. Yeah, well, if I can add something, uh, just the end. I, I agree with all of you, and uh, and 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 of course, I'm I'm using two techniques to be sure that my systems are as, pro as well. it, it, they are good enough. So it's like there are risk assessments, and we are auditing. So, for example, it's like it's like all the robots are HIPAA compliant. So we have like auditing all the systems. We have all the process of auditing the systems to be HIPAA compliant. I think that it's like uh, the, the human beings um, are vulnerable because it's like they, they require like understanding of the system and, uh, and uh, children, it's like they are in the process of learning and understanding and they have some limitations there. And also we are learning from mistakes and the kids, they had a short life to learn from mistakes before. So this, this is a difficult because everything is super new. Uh, the challenge from a legal point of view, it's like what I have seen that it's happening in multiple countries and I'm doing research internationally. So believe me, it's like I'm a big hater of GDPR. Yeah. I love GDPR, but it's like it's limiting a lot international research <laughs> in the way that it's conceived. Why? Because most of these like risk assessment, what they target, it's a risk reduction instead of a risk management, uh, deciding the liability. What is the liability? Some cases, the liability has to go to the legal uh, guardians and they need to be to teach the kids and to let it manage correctly. And sometimes it's like the liability has to go to the, to the designer and sometimes it has to go to the manufacturer. So uh, I, I, yeah, I, I would love to see like some of the policies that are like towards the risk management instead of the risk reduction. Uh, that mm -hmm. is like, I also work for a big corporation as entity data. And what I think is like all the legal departments say, yo, you cannot do that, you cannot do that, you cannot do that, you cannot do that. But we have to to say no in order to have a compromise. We are we are used to uh, find the, comp the right compromise. So if we say always yes at the first very question, it's the end for us, you know. It's always I, a, a I, game of risks and opportunities. And so- I, I, I agree. And I think the opportunity is to work together. And that's the reason because Edward, that it was like a, a, a PhD student of a legal school, he was visiting my lab and stayed with me, helping me to understand the boundaries of the law that was allowing us to apply the technology yeah. in the right way. And I was helping him to develop his risk assessment that now I'm using for my designs. Because the, the, the main issue is the, uh, then the misuse of what you create. So we we, uh, we have to, to look also forward the the, uh, the 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 first use and purposes of the, the technique that you you develop. So the, the, this is the, yeah. uh, the the boundaries of, of the topic. We have one minute for one questions related to the uh, e-learning and uh, education. So um, during the pandemic, uh, children moved and had the, the opportunity to have to to exercise their right to education thanks to e-learning, and they moved their education into into e-platforms e, e instead of face-to-face -face, uh, classes. This was an opportunity, to, but, but perhaps it changes also the level of acceptability of risks. Of course, if my 60 years old daughter had to, to, to uh, do her homework in a given system, uh, I uh, didn't read the policy condition of that, of that platform. And I, I, can, I, I can confess. What is your opinion? It's an effect of the pandemic, <laughs> but we will see when the pandemic will end, how to, to uh, prevent this in, uh, for, for the future, because perhaps also education will change and will move uh, in a more stable way uh, in, uh, in the IoT uh, environment.
So I think we have no more time for discussing, but at this stage, but please email us, be in touch with us, because uh, I think we, we, we created a, a very um, enthusiastic group to work on these topics. And uh, thank you very much to, to all of you for your talks, for your time, and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.